Good afternoon from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting for Neurosurgical TV. We have number four in the series of Neuroanatomy arranged by Ulrich Sidney, a medical student from Cameroon. It's a series of webinars and we're pleasured uh, by the presence of a world-renowned neuroanatomist, Victor Hugo Perez Perez. But before we turn it over to Victor, let's introduce the students to Victor. Hello, Dylan. Could you please introduce yourself to Victor? Hi. Hi, Victor. Hello. I'm, How are you? I'm Dylan. I'm Dylan. I'm, uh, Victor, what year are you, Dylan? What year student are you? Seventh year medical student. Okay, welcome. And Natalie, who's going to present after Victor, could you please introduce yourself? And Ulrich. Hello. I'm Natalie Gomsi from Cameroon. I'm a medical doctor already. And I think I'm the second uh, today. Okay, and Ulrich? Hola. Sorry, uh, Ulrich Sydney. Nice to meet you. Hola, <laughs> aprendiendo español. Do you speak Spanish? Hablas un poquito español. Mi, mi español está muy, muy bien. Un poco. Excelente. A little, a little bit. Un poco, un poco. Yeah. Okay, Victor, welcome, and it's all yours. Okay, nice to see you again. Uh, we are going to talk uh, today about uh, an special staining of uh, some uh, brain cuts. So this is very interesting because um, let me put um, this one, the conference in here. So uh, while screening, so can you see? Can you see it? Uh, yes. Yes? Yes, we can. Yes. Mulligan staining. Uh, well, I have the honor to be a member of uh, the Committee of Neurosurgical Anatomy of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Uh, that's the reason I am very interested in showing some techniques and some uh, aspects, really interesting aspects of the brain and spinal cord. So what you are seeing in this uh, slide is a sagittal cut of, the, of a brain. So uh, if you see a, a, a brain cut, it's difficult to, to understand the anatomical parts of the brain. Uh, for example, here we have the frontal lobe, parietal, occipital, and here we have the cerebellum and the olive uh, nuclei. So here is the midbrain, pons, and uh, medulla. So uh, we are going to see several cuts. Uh, like here, we, uh, here we have the, the chiasm body. Uh, this is the chiasm body, the cingulum. Look at this, this is a singulum. So, uh, and uh, here we have uh, some uh, nuclei of the, of, uh, the brain. So, uh, this is a close uh, view of uh, brain stem, the middle, uh, the, the midbrain, the pons and medulla, and also cerebellum. So, uh, after seeing this, uh, I want you to, to, to see what we are doing. This is uh, an, uh, uh, the staining of, uh, a brain, of some brain cuts. So uh, in order to see much better the structures of the brain. Uh, for example, in this cut, uh, you cannot uh, differentiate the some parts of uh, this cut is difficult, but if you stain only only the gray substance, you can differentiate the white substance and gray substance. For example, in this. So uh, this is the result of the anterior 
cut. This is uh, the cut without staining and the cut after staining. So we, we can differentiate some structures of these cuts. For example, in here. Uh, here we have the anterior nu nucleus of thalamus, the head of caudate nucleus, cuneus, calcarine sulcus, globose nucleus, medial lemniscus, superior cerebellar peduncle, red nucleus, substantia nigra, and ventral anterior nucleus of thalamus. But where are they? So if we, we try to differentiate these structures in this cut, I think that it's a little difficult to do that. But if we stain the brain coat with some staining like a mulligan stain, look at this. Now we can differentiate much better these cuts. For example, anterior nucleus of thalamus. This is the anterior nucleus of thalamus. The head of caudate nucleus. The cuneus is in here. Calcarin sulcus. Here we have the calcarin sulcus. Globose nucleus. This is globose nucleus. Medial lemniscus is in this in this part of the brain. These tracts are not stained because you know what we are staining in this brain coat is only gray substance. So that's the reason you can differentiate the tracts. For example, in this, this is the superior cerebellar peduncle, this one. We have the red nucleus in here and the substance the substantia nigra in this part. So let's go to see another one. Here we have the genu of corpus callosum, the claustrum, frontal operculum, the insula, the splenium of corpus callosum, choroidal plexus, Posterior limb of internal capsule, the putamen, and head of caudate nucleus. Here, putamen and head of caudate nucleus, and column of fornix. So, yes, I agree. You can differentiate and you can visualize these structures in this axial cut. But, Let's go to see with a mulligan staining. This is really beautiful because you can differentiate very, very well these structures. Here we have the genu of corpus callosum, then claustrum in this part, with number three, the operculum. The fourth is insula. Number five, splenium of corpus callosus. Six, choroid plexus. Seven, posterior limb of internal capsule. Look at this. What's the reason you are seeing the internal capsule in color white? Is a question. What's the reason you are seeing the posterior limb of internal capsule in color white? And why you can see the head of caudate nucleus with, with this color, in color blue? Why? The, the um, uh, internal capsule is made up of white matter. 
It is the it's made of the axons of the pyramidal cells from the cortex, whereas the um, uh, uh, the gray the gray um, uh, my gray sample. Uh, oh, the the cordate nucleus is made up of uh, gray matter. Agree. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So that's the reason uh, you you can differentiate white substance and gray substance. For example, the head of caudate nucleus is in color blue, and this is the column of fornix. So. Um, Okay, this is another cut. This is a really beautiful cut. Uh, and let's go to see uh, uh, this, this another axial cut. The hippocampus is uh, number one. Para hippocampal sulcus, uh, vermis, uh, basis, basis of pedunculi, and substantia nigra. But it's difficult to differentiate. But uh, in some, if we stain, these uh, cuts, we are going to differentiate very well. So this is a variation of the mulligan state. This is also a staining, but in this case, you can see the gray substance in color, in color, in color brown, color brown. So uh, this is a normal uh, cut and, and coronal cut, but this is with the, with the variation of mulligan staining and in this variation you are not going to get the color blue for gray substance instead this is in color brown but it's also a beautiful a beautiful method to differentiate this staining uh, here for example we have the hippocampus in number one look at this this is a really beautiful uh, uh, axial cut uh, this is the hippocampus, the parahippocampus, para hippocampus, uh, or para hippocampal sulcus, uh, the basis of pedoncle, this is this one, and uh, in number four, the substantia nigra. Uh, this is uh, in Spanish, uh, sorry for this, but this is uh, how to make uh, this uh, technique of mulligan is not difficult. If you look for mulligan staining in uh, internet, you you can get the method to to make this kind of staining. The only one is you need some uh, uh, some uh, uh, for example, some uh, staining, uh, uh, I think the most difficult to get is uh, a brain, a uh, very well fixed brain in order to make a, a good, good cuts. So you need also, uh, with this uh, preparation is uh, with some uh, heat, 65 degrees. This is Mulligan with uh, copper sulfate. We are taking uh, temperature in order to put uh, in there the, the brain coat. Uh, the second step is to, to wash the brain coat in cold water. Then uh, the third step is to put the brain coat in a solution with a ferric chloride. So then we put the brain coat in a solution with a ferrocyanide for 15 to 20 seconds. And uh, look at this. This is the the, the the cut brain without without staining and then after you can see how this uh, brain coat is uh, changing its color all the gray substance is changing to um, color blue This is uh, like uh, magic. Uh, this is a magic step. 
Uh, so, uh, if you want to train doing this uh, technique, you can make this in uh, uh, in pig brains, in, in, in pig brains. <coughs> <coughs> The pain of a pig is uh, you can get this uh, you can get uh, the pig brain very easy. It's, it's easier to to get that kind of brains. Uh, for example, in this frontal view, uh, look at this uh, in the left side. We have a, a coronal cut without without staining, and in the right side after the staining. Um, look uh, at this uh, slide. It's uh, really, really uh, beautiful to make this uh, staining. <coughs> Again. <coughs> For example, the, the putamen the pallidus nuclei, nucleus. Uh, the uh, here we have the 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 thalamus and the caudate uh, nuclei. This one and some uh, parts of uh, the pons. Let's go to see what's happening with this uh, <coughs> mulligan state. Uh, in here is uh, easier to to see and differentiate the structures. For for example, in this one, look at uh, uh, the hippocampus. It's really really beautiful uh, to see this this uh, this part of uh, the brain. This is another another cut. After the staining of a mulligan, we can get this, the olivar nucleus in the, in the medulla, the pons. This is the, what, what is this tract? This is a question. Can you, can you see this tract? This is the other one. This is a corticospinal tract. Now we are going. We are going to see uh, uh, several cuts of this of this brain. I, I put uh, first of all. I I stained the all all the cuts of uh, this brain, and then after. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, to remove this, uh, excuse me, sorry, okay. Are you okay there, Victor? Yes. Okay. Can you can you hear about? Uh, can you hear? I, are we supposed to hear the video? No, we don't hear the video. 
Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I thought that you that you can hear the video. Well, you know what so, you can do, Victor. You can restart the screen share and click on the option to sh hear the sound. Do you want us to hear the sound? Okay, no, no problem. Okay, it's, it's very, it's very short. Okay, so I am removing the coronal cuts of uh, this brain. So I think is uh, uh, this technique is very useful to understand the the anatomy of uh, some tracts of uh, some nucleus. Cerebellum. So, Victor, sorry. Yes. Um, yes. Is this is this like a double staining? Because we what we saw before was like reddish in, uh, in staining. Right now we see red and blue. Did you do two stains on the? No. The, this is uh, uh, I think like uh, some artifact, some um, uh, variation of the temperature. And uh, that's the reason some of them are, uh, 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 some of them uh, got uh, very, very well the substance and other uh, didn't get uh, the, the chemical, chemical reaction. Uh, so that's the reason. Okay, thanks. So if you want some uh, some day we can we I, I can show you how to make this uh, step by step so it's not difficult uh, the most difficult is to get a, a human fresh brain uh, first of all you you uh, you need to to fixate to fix to fix the the brain with formal and uh, after 15 or 20 days, you should remove all the arachnoid with vessels. And then after to make uh, very, very good cuts, very nice cuts, uh, precise cuts. And then after uh, to get uh, the substance, the chemical substance. And uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, difficult to make this kind of staining, and you are going to learn uh, very well uh, the internal anatomy of the brain. Uh, so I think this is uh, uh, very, very important to understand. Uh, neurosurgery is a, a really difficult uh, discipline because uh, you need to know uh, internal, external, so many anatomical structures. So uh, that's the reason I wanted to show you this uh, Mujigan state. And uh, in the next um, conference, uh, I, I'm going to show you the um, uh, external uh, conformation of brain uh, with some videos also. So. In this uh, moment, uh, I finish this uh, this uh, this talk. Okay, very good, Victor. I like. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as always, a great presentation. You know, Victor, we're we're going to televise next week a, a, a live cadaver dissection from Nairobi, Kenya, next week, and you uh, for a couple of days in the in the lab, cadaver lab in Nairobi. They have a cadaver yes. lab there. And we're going to try to get in on the brain dissection, and we're going to—I'll let you know about that. And you're also invited to, you know, to come in and check, you know, see what they're doing over there. When is it going to be? It's going to be, uh, I think, the Friday and Saturday, I believe, next of next week. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, uh, but we have—we're going to have to hook up the setup, you know, so we have an overhead camera. Uh, and a microphone on the dissector. You know, you know, you've probably done them before, right? In laboratories that are set up for it. Are you going to Nairobi? Uh, no, Bennett? no, we're gonna no, we're gonna televise it from here. But I mean, we're gonna okay. they're gonna the students here are having a conference, a cadaver lab, and we're gonna televise it. You you should go there. You are the star. Yeah, I would I would love to. Uh, <laughs> I would love to, Victor. And I I told the uh, I told the. Natalie, I think I would love to go there. I would love to go there. 
especially yes. if we find a good group of enthusiastic kids that will help the project. Yeah, I would go there in a heartbeat. Good, good. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I think most people don't realize the work you put in in these uh, sections. You you dedicate pretty well your life, right, to to anatomy. Yes. Yes, uh, full time. Uh, you probably don't don't do much surgery, right? A little bit of spine. Uh, uh, what do you do now, Victor, in the OR? Well, I, I spend more time in in uh, doing uh, some um, uh, research of uh, uh, mainly in uh, uh, arteries and veins of uh, the spinal cord. Okay. So that's my. In, in this time, I am working uh, in in doing that kind of research. Yes. And are you affiliated with the university, like UNAM or, or another university there, doing yes. that research? Uh, no, in the Forensic uh, Sciences Institute in Mexico. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Can you show us that website, please? Website? Yeah, they have a website. Oh, uh, I don't know. Okay, now. don't worry about it. Don't worry okay. about it. I was thinking. Okay. Uh, so you're head of the Forensic Hello, Society. Jeff. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nathalie. Please, I have a question. Go ahead. Dr. Perez, how do you uh, do so that the, 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 cerebral should just, the cerebrum should just be clean, just clean like that? And at what temperature do you do your staining? Okay, uh, this uh, Mujigan staining is, uh, you can look uh, for this in internet. So uh, there are, so uh, there are too much information about this uh, Mujigan staining. But if you want, I can show you how to do this. Uh, you can do that in a uh, pig brain because uh, pig brain is, is not uh, a, a small, it's a good, good size, the, the pig of, uh, the brain of a pig. So it's easy to get a, a, a pig brain. So um, after this, uh, you you need to fix it in formaldehyde, and after 15 or 20 days, remove the arachnoid with the blood vessels, and then after to make the cuts. And, uh, uh, and after that, uh, uh, to get the substance uh, to to make this uh, kind of staining. So a period of two weeks, huh? You have to wait. Uh, three weeks, four weeks, uh, more or less. Okay. Yes. After the injection of the latex. Mm, no, this brain is not injected. Oh. Uh, it's it's uh, only only the brain. Okay. When when does the latex get injected? What at what stage? Uh, no, in, in no in no stage. Oh, the, the, oh okay. The staining is for this. The oh, okay. This is something totally different. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. At what temperature is there? Uh, is it supposed to be stained? It's 65 or 70 grades. Centigrades. Thank you. You're welcome. Ulrich, you okay? Marco, are you okay? Hello, Marco. Hello, Marco. Hello, Marco. Nice to see you. I see you again, uh, old people. Uh, and thank you for your presentation, Victor. It's uh, absolutely nice uh, and um, uh, it's uh, wonderful how uh, the uh, neuroanatomy lesson made by a neurosurgeon, I think, is the best uh, we can uh, desire. Thank yes, you. It's, it's good to see that because uh, uh, you are going to get uh, very useful information about the anatomy, so That's right. I think it's good, yes. And I guess you must know why it's important in certain places that you know that anatomy, for certain cases. I guess there's certain parts of the anatomy you have to know very, very good. I mean, you have to know it all, I guess. <laughs> That's a dumb question, I'm sorry, <laughs> or dumb comment. <laughs> but I'm not a neurosurgeon, so I get a break. <laughs> okay, we have another guest there. Hello there, uh, G Flex Two. Can you introduce yourself to Victor? G Flex, go ahead. Are you there, G Flex? Well, maybe not. Okay. 
Okay, Victor, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to hang around if you like. And I, I believe Natalie is going to uh, present on the occiput. Is that correct, Natalie? Yes. Okay. Natalie? I hope she didn't leave us. She may have yes. just been bumped off. Sometimes that happens yes. with... Uh, I, 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 I'm really sorry because uh, now, right now, I, I am leaving to okay. Puebla. No problem. No problem, to, Victor. No problem. But uh, sorry. Okay, uh, thank you very uh, much for your uh, time. Ne next week, uh, uh, we can talk about uh, the, the external anatomy of brain and spinal cord. Very I'm good. going to show you some uh, videos. So okay. thank you so much. Okay, it's great, really Victor. A pleasure. I, I feel very honored to, to be with, with, with all of you. Well, I know the African kids love this, Victor. Uh, and we're going to show it to a lot of people. Uh, during the week, it's a little busy. Students are working, et cetera. But they'll be able yes, to see the I video. Know. They'll be able to see the video. Yes, uh, I know. Which we'll, we'll archive with the other uh, seven videos of the series. Yes. So um, we also invite you next week to uh, the presentation for the Cadaver Lab yes. from Nairobi. I'll let you know sure. on that. So sure. we're going to end this, end this, and we'll start on, Nat on uh, Natalie's. Thanks, Victor. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is part two of the uh, neuroanatomy series from Cameroon, arranged by Ulrich Sidney and other medical students of Cameroon. <clears throat> We're glad to meet them. Um, Nathalie, Nathalie is going to talk about the occiput. Uh, we just had a great presentation from Victor Hugo Perez Perez. Uh, let's meet our guests before we turn it over to Nathalie. Uh, hello, Marco. Hi, guys. Nice to meet you again. Uh, for uh, who know, don't know, I'm uh, Marco Meloni. I'm a, a consultant neurosurgeon in the North Italy, close to Como. Welcome, ah, Mar Italy. Welcome, Marco. Yeah. Good. Marco. Okay, go ahead. I uh, was in uh, Congress of Mans last year <laughs> in Naples. Where? Naples. Uh, do you attend of uh, Mans Congress? Naples last year, June. In Naples. It was Ipes conference, right? Uh, I uh, asked you if you was uh, in Man's Congress uh, last year in uh, at Naples, Naples. Oh, okay. Well, we can talk. Uh, we, we can network after introductions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Ulrich, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Ulrich Sydney, uh, finally a medical student and a research associate at uh, Harvard, starting July this year. Nice to meet you all. Very good, Ulrich. And Nuru, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Nuru. Uh, I'm come from, from Benin, but now I am in Morocco, and I am in my third year's residency course in neurosurgery in the Rabat Center WFNS uh, uh, Reference uh, uh, tra Center of Training of Young Neurosurgery in Africa. You're going to Nepal for his residency. That's, that's great news. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if I got Dylan. Oh, Dylan, hello. Can you please introduce yourself? Let me unmute you there, Dylan. Can you unmute there? I'm yes, we are here. Okay. Go, ahead, go ahead, Dylan. I'm, I'm Dylan, seventh year medical student from Cameroon. Nice okay. to meet you. All. Welcome, Dylan. And G Flex 2, I don't know if you're there. Could you please introduce yourself? G Flex 2. If not, Okay, Nathalie, we'll take turn it over to you and welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Nathalie. I'll unmute you there. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Just, just give Nathalie a give her five minutes, please. There's a there's an issue with the connection right no now. No problem. No problem. Uh, okay. Let me let me see. Uh, so Nuru, when when do you uh, plan on going to Nepal? Um, maybe next month uh, in July. I don't know yet, but I will let you know when I Are have you going more. for a fellowship, like three months or six months? Yes, or? yes, yes. I think that is three months or six months like that. Okay, uh, because there are about six people. There were six people at one time. The yes, fellows. it is in the department of Felipe Sherian, about school base. Yeah, yeah. There's another African... Uh, uh, resident there, I think, uh, from uh, Tanzania, I believe. He's there. He's there now. Good. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm a good person to know for that kind of stuff. 
he knows a lot of people and because when i went there last was it last year um there was no program no fellows he was just starting uh with with uh uh dr yuha yuha hernandez demi was there and they were just starting off but he's grown pretty quickly to have six fellows okay. already any luck in that natalie i'm gonna let you in here again okay Yeah, Natalie's coming in, and she'll be starting shortly. There you go. Okay, Natalie, you want to give it a shot? Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Natalie. Hello. Okay, I'm Natalie Christel. I'm a general practitioner in Cameroon, and today I want to present uh, on the uh, occipital bone. Okay. And it's surgical importance. Very good. I don't know if everybody can get me. We can, we can get you. It's okay. It looks good. Please, a minute. There we go. Like I was saying, I'll present on the occipital bone and surgical importance. Our main objectives were, were to uh, have a global knowledge on the anatomy of the occipital bone and its neurosurgical and clinical uh, value as well. In order to uh, achieve our objectives, we have the following plan. After a brief introduction, we shall uh, recall a little on the embryology. We shall go into detail in the anatomy. So, give some surgical values, and then we shall conclude. As the introduction, we'll say that uh, the occipital bone is a trapezoid-shaped flat bone, unpaired flat bone, which is situated at the back on the and lower part of the cranium. It is pierced by the foramen magnum through which, dispersed by the foramen magnum through which it communicates with the cranial, with the, the to which, uh, the cranial cavity communicates with the vertebral parts. It is made up of three portions. We have the squama, we have the squama, the basilar parts, and we have the lateral, two lateral parts. It has four borders, two superlateral, two inferior, four angles, two superior, inferior, and two lateral. To talk about its embryology, we we'll said that um, in early ontogeny, the occipital bone begins by to form from five bones. We have a central part, which is the basi occipital. I, I don't know if everybody is seeing with my uh, here so. The basi occipital, which is just in front of the foramen magnum. We have the two lateral parts, which are the oxo occipitals, where the occipital condyles are found. We also have two in the flat back, which forms the squama. We have to note that the occipital bone is an ontogenetically mixed bone that is made up of cartilaginous part and a membranous part. The cartilaginous part are the anterior part, which is made up of the exo and the basi occipitals, while the membranous part is mainly made up of the squama, which we can see with my... Uh, my cursor. Talking about the anatomy, we will start with the squamous occipitalis, the first part. It is a curved, it is situated behind, behind the foramen magnum. It is curved, it is curved and expanded place just behind the foramen magnum. It is quadrilateral in shape. It articulates with six bones. We have the temporas, the two temporals, the sphenoid, the two octaetals, and the atlas downwards. It has an equally two surface, an external or exocranial surface, and an internal or intracranial surface. The, ex the, ex the external surface of the... Let me stop the video. My uh, video is a little bit poor. I'll just stop the video to be more... Okay. The extracranial, the extracranial or external surface is a curved surface 
which presents which presents midway between between the submit and the foramen magnum a crest a protuberance called the external occipital protuberance it is made up of four nuclear lines which extends <laughs> which extends from the nuclear plane the occipital plane up to the nuclear plane down we have the highest nuclear line which gives insertion attachment to the gallia aponeurotica we have the superior nuclear line which gives attachment to four muscles. You have the occipitalis, the, trape the trapezoids, you have the sternocleidomastoid, and we have the splenoscapitis. Above this line, the, hi the highest nuclear line and the superior nuclear line, we have the occipital plane. We have the occipital plane, and just, just under these two, we have the nuclear plane. There is a medial nuclear line which descends from the external occipital protuberance to the foramen magnum. It gives insertion to the ligament nucleus. It gives insertion to the ligament nucleus. Running midline between the uh, the midline between the middle nuclear line and the and the fur and the Nuclear plane is the inferior nuclear line. The inferior nuclear line gives insertion to two major muscle, uh, muscles, which are the rectus, rectus capitis posterioris major and minor. These are this all these uh, muscles are muscles which permit the movements of the neck uh, in all its um, its axis. Then we have the internal surface. The internal surface is divided into four great fossa by the cruciate eminence. We can see the cruciate eminence. It has the form of a cross. We have two upper fossa which are triangular and which lodges the occipital lobes and two lower fossa which are quadrilateral which lodges the cerebral hemispheres. We also have at the center uh, the internal occipital protuberance. The upper division of this internal occipital protuberance runs running to the superior angle, which we can see here. Sorry, which we can see here. On its right side is the sagittal sulcus. In this sagittal sulcus, the hind part of uh, this sagittal sulcus lodges the hind part of the superior sagittal uh, sinus and where this superior sagittal sinus also gives insertion to the fat cerebri. The lower division of the internal occipital crest, which bifurcates at the foramen magnum, we can see down here, near the foramen magnum, gives attachment to the fat cerebelli, where, uh, which also gives attachment itself to the occipital sinuses. We'll see it further. Its upper part is made of the vermian fossa, which lodges the vermis of the cerebelli. On either side of the internal of the internal occipital protuberance are uh, the is the transverse groove, which lodges the transverse sinuses and extends from the internal occipital protuberance to the lateral angles. You can see it. this part gives attachment to the tentorium cerebelli. There is a confluence between the superior sagittal sinus and the transverse sinus. This confluence gives this, uh, this groove where we can meet what they call, uh, this confluence forms the torcula or the confluence of sinuses, as they call. Secondly, we have the lateral parts. The lateral parts are found on either sides. On either side of the foramen magnum, sorry, we can't see it here. And on either side, you can also of the lateral part is mainly made up of the occipital condyles. The occipital condyles permit the articulations between the dispersion between the occipital bone and the superior facet of the atlas. It is oval in shape with two extremities. We have an anterior extremity and a posterior extremity to which is attached the atlanteo occipital articulation. 
and immediately to it we have the a tubercle which is the which gives uh, insertion to the alar ligaments at the base of the occipital condyle we have the hippo the hippoglossal canal which gives passage to the dwarf nerve penile nerve and the meningeal branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery beside Beside each occipital uh, condyle, uh, occipital condyle are condyloid fossas, which receive parts of the, sorry, the, con the, the occipital condyles, which, which receive parts of the, of the superior facet of C1 during hyperextension of the, of the neck. At the base of the occipital condyle are the is the con is the condylar canal? This condylar canal receives uh, gives passage to emissary veins coming from the transverse sinus. Laterally, we have the jugular the jugular process. You can see. Laterally, we have the jugular process, which gives insertions to the rectus capitis lateralis and the ligament the lig uh, atlanto occipital ligament. From the surface of, from this surface is the paramastoid surface, which articulates with the transverse process, process of C1. At its upper surface is the jugular tubercle, we can see here. This jugular tubercle has a groove where the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh nerves, cranial nerves, cross to go to the extracranial part of the, of the brain. The third part is the basilar part. The basilar part is directed forward and upward from the pharmacmandum. It articulates in front with the, with the sphenoid bone and form what's called the clivus. At the inferior surface, we have the pharyngeal tubercle pharyngeal tuberculosis, which gives insertions to the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle and the pharyngeal raphe. Its upper surface represents a shallow groove, you can see here. It presents a shallow groove which supports the medulla oblongata. Yes, yeah, here is the shallow groove, which supports the medulla oblongata and gives attachment to the membrana pectoria. Laterally, we have the inferior petrosal, the groove which receives the inferior petrosal surfaces. I think this sinuses, sorry. The occipital bone has mainly four angles. We have a superior angle, which we see here, which articulates with the angles, the occipital angles of the parietal bones, this in red. We have two lateral angles, at the extremes of the transverse sinus, which receive the interval of the mastoid parts of both the parietal and the temporal bone, you can see up and down. And then we have an inferior angle, which fuses with the body of the splenoid anteriorly. We have also four borders. Four borders, we have a superior lateral, two superior lateral borders, which forms the lambdoid suture. It articulates with the parietal bones. We have inferior lateral borders, which forms the occipitomastoid structures, which articulates with the mastoid process of the temporal bones. And we have the, sorry. And we have the petrooccipital structures, which articulates with the petrous part of the temporal bone. We also have the sphenooccipital sutures, which fuses with uh, during adolescence at home 20, uh, when he reaches 22 to 25 years old. Now, talking about the surgical value, we say that one of the most important steps in posterior cranium opening is localizing dual venous sinuses. As seen before, we see that the Posterior fossa is made up of uh, is made up of four or four to five main venous sinuses, amongst which we have the transverse sinuses, <laughs> we have the superior sagittal sinuses, we have the occipital sinuses, or the inferior the, the inferior sinuses. 
We can see some of them here. We have the transverse sinus, we have the sigmoid sinus, we have the occipital sinus, and we have the inferior, the inferior occipital sinus, uh, petrosal sinuses. Intraoperative damages of these sinuses may result in profuse bleeding and later thrombosis, venous alpha disturbance, or increase in cranial, in cranial pressure. We have uh, three main neurosurgical approaches of the occipital, uh, of the posterior fossa. We have the suboccipital, midline suboccipital uh, approach. We have the lateral suboccipital approach. And we have also the ritual mastoid approach. I don't know if anybody, everybody can see. The main, the main positions used during uh, the uh, surgery of the posterior fossa are the sitting position. You can see it on the first, on the first diagram. We have the back bench position and we have the prone position. The most used from my leg, from my my findings are the park bench position and the sitting position. We will start with the midline subacetal approach. The midline subacetal approach permits us to uh, have a larger view of the posterior fossa up to the cranial cervical junction. As you can see, we have all the, all the structures which can be seen when opening through this approach. How is it done? We do, usually, uh, we do a median incision two centimeters above the inion. The inion is the most salient part of the occipital bone, most protruding part of the occipital bone to the spine process of C4, as you can see. The craniotomy is done with a high speed drill from, this, from the <coughs> From the transverse sinuses, that's the repair from the transverse sinuses to the foramen magnum, and takes also part of the posterior arc of C1. Why doing this procedure? We must be careful so not to injure the atlantoidal occipital portion of the vertebral artery, which enters just laterally. Second, you have the far lateral suboccipital approach. The far lateral subcutaneous approach is mainly used when we have a we have an injury or a lesion of the the, the hemispheres of the cerebellum. The first image, the first diagram illustrates the incision. The incision goes from the tip of the ipsilateral mastoid. It continues above the superior nuchal lines. It's above the superior nuchal line and then descends medially up to C3. Be careful with this, uh, with the far lateral suboccipital approach and the retreat mastery approach. We have some landmarks, and one of the landmarks is the asterion. The asterion is that portion where uh, the lat the Occipital, the occipitalis, the temporalis, and the, the temporalis and the parietal bone meet. That's what's called the asterion. Uh, the asterion. And the asterion has been, uh, they have been described, they have been described many techniques on how to, uh, to, to repair or to, how to uh, find, how, how to give landmarks, uh, bone landmarks or, uh, or muscle landmarks, or um, uh, muscle, or using muscles to, to to look or find these landmarks, particularly the asterion, because the asterion is the part which is most next to the to the transverse sinus. We also have the traumatic approach. The traumatic approach is mostly used when you have the cerebellopontine angle meningiomas, for example. And this in this uh, approach, we have different incisions can be made. We have the linear incision, we have the curved incision, and we have the curvy line incision, as you can see. This is a curved incision. A linear incision can be made, a curved incision as, as here, and uh, a curvy line incision. We have to know that when we do a linear incision, it gives us less, 
it, it gives us less space. It gives us less space to do our craniotomy. So it's usually used when we want to use an uh, endoscopy to, for the surgery. This, uh, this article was written by Dr. Kivulev and collaborators in 2016. He used muzzle insertion line as a last, as a simple landmark to identify the, the transverse sinus when neural navigation is unavailable. I think this is an important uh, article for particularly also in low and middle income countries where we don't usually have this neural navigation techniques. Uh, this article was, uh, he used uh, the insertion of uh, muzzles such as the rectus, capi the, re the rectus capitis posterior majoris and minoris. And he realized that with, uh, uh, he did an MRI on most of the patients, about 66 patients who were supposed to be operated with having posterior lesions. He used MRI and used a, a T1 and T2, the T1 and T2, when he realized that the insertion of these muscles were about 1.4 centimeters under the transverse sinus, as you can see. On the 56 patients, on the 56 patients that uh, he, on, whom, on whom he made the study, realized that the insertion of these uh, muscles were just one to two centimeters under the transverse sinus. Meaning that if you want to do, for example, a craniectomy, if you do it just under the insertion, uh, at the level of the, of the insertion of these muscles, we have less risk to injure the transverse sinus and then cause complications. So to conclude, I'll say that the occipital bone uh, has important landmarks for surgical procedures of the posterior fossa and the craniocervical junction. Skull opening in occipital and supraocipital regions might be associated with the risk of damage of the transverse venous sinus and the confluence of sinuses, also called torculum. So a good knowledge of this anat anatomy renders neurosurgical approach easier and less risky. Thank you. Are you sure that you're ready? Yes. Great. Okay, I'm sorry. I had some. Uh, thank you very much, Natalie, for putting that together and taking the time. Uh, can we have some comments or questions from any of the panelists? Um, I'd like to make a comment. Go ahead. Okay, so I'd just like to say uh, I was really great. What I, I really very much appreciated was the, the, the detailed description of the surgical importance of the hospital, especially the article at the end where she highlighted a really important part for we who are in LMICs, like for the approaches for the posterior fossa and then uh, the, the technique based on the muscle insertion was really very great. Did you get that, Natalie? Was that a comment or just a question? Thank you. Thank yeah, it you. was just Thank a comment. You. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Very good. Um, now, th this is a question. I don't know if it's related. Uh, what animals are similar to human brains to simulate uh, dissections? Is there any, like rats or, or rabbits? Is there any species, Marco, that that uh, rather than we're getting a human brain, you can kind of uh, dissect similar anatomy in an animal. Are there any animals similar that neurosurgeons use if they can't get to a cadaver? Mm, well, actually, in my experience, uh, uh, I, I saw uh, the use of a uh, 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 of a shed, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a shape, uh, shape, shape brain, shape brain in some course, in particular in a pediatric neurosurgery. Okay, uh, quite similar. Similar anatomy, pretty similar. Yeah. And uh, in my own experience, uh, 
I uh, joined a course about the use of uh, Flosil, is an hemostatic material, and we use uh, some uh, big pig uh, under general anesthesia to, mm -hmm. see, to, to uh, perform laminectomy uh, in a spine uh, and they use the Flosil. Mm -hmm. so so, similar anatomy, right? Yeah, and obviously uh, we cannot forget the use of uh, uh, of the, the the rats in the, the uh, vascular anastomosis is very important. Okay, and the, the use of what's that again, uh, Marco? The uh, use of uh, what? Yeah, it, it's not about brain, but in neurosurgery practice, uh, the use of rats, uh, mouse, uh, to oh, gra graphs like vein graphs and. Yeah, exactly. Vein okay. graft anastomosis uh, to perform bypass uh, is a, a very as very good uh, training uh, using this uh, animal. Oh, okay. Now, have the students done any, any labs like that where you, you're sewing and doing anastomosis? Are we doing that yet, or that comes with more training? Natalie or Rick or Dylan, have you guys done any of that at all? Not okay. Okay, that's something that'll come later, I'm sure. And uh, I, I want to take advantage, John, to uh, thanks Natalie for your presentation. It's just very beautiful, and uh, I uh, appreciate a lot the uh, uh, the aspect, the surgical uh, uh, practice in uh, occipital bone. Uh, the surgical uh, yeah we have two panelists that are going to nepal naru and and most likely natalie oh mm. well, obviously uh thanks to you. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i was turning into a real training ground for africa there i would uh, i would like to thank uh, natalie for his great uh, for his, uh, his great presentation and uh thank you and uh, it is always some and uh I hope it is very important to uh, to know uh, about anatomy of bones of uh, all the region, like uh, occipital, because we know that uh, uh, the lobe, uh, the occipital lobe, uh, in uh, if you want to to, to remove um, uh, fossa cerebral posterior uh, tumor, like you have to know correctly the anatomy to done your your approach. Uh, so it is very, very important to, to, to know, uh, because anatomy, it is like the way. <laughs> so if you don't know the way, you can't operate. So it is, uh, it is important uh, to, to learn more and read everyday anatomy. It is so complicated. Uh, so thank, thank you, you. For, uh, for, your, for your presentation. Thank you, thank you, Nora. Yeah, it's a lifelong study, right? In the career of a neurosurgeon, lifelong. Uh, and, and you know, you know, Nauru, uh, Natalie will be able to use this video as part of her resume, her, her video resume, because it'll really be proof that she was at a conference, she gave a presentation, a very good presentation, and included in the panel were a couple of neurosurgeons, residents, one from Italy. I mean, this is great uh, in her resume. It'll look really good. Uh, and I think that... Uh, People, rather than having paper resumes, they'll have video resumes. Where, okay. You know, Prospective employers can easily check, you know. So, okay, very good. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, uh, Natalie. Uh, we'll talk later after this. And thank uh, Ulrich and and. Uh, thank you. Thank Mark. you very much. That, uh, that, what, what? I'm going to stay here. We'll just sign off officially, okay? Okay, we'll see you <laughs> next week. Okay, yeah. thank you.